Hey there. Thanks for tuning in. You ready for another episode of my Bigfoot sighting? All right then. Let's do this. Seen a bunch of run-down new horse towns where the church is the backbone, loves in the bow. And the five-string melodies groove in. With the farmland rows where the roots run deep. Beyond the noise of the busy streets. Where the songs of the south are soothing. When I hear the front porch picking down home rhythm ringing out. I don't run from banjo music. My first Bigfoot sighting happened on an island with no name. This sighting occurred in northern Manitoba in 1987. It was the first experience that I'd had anything to do with Bigfoot. I grew up in a family where we didn't have an uncle who told stories around the campfire about Bigfoot. And I was basically unaware that this creature even existed outside of just some of the folklore that you'd see as a child in the PG film. I grew up the son of a hunting and fishing guide. And in 1987, I had just graduated from high school in a small town in South Dakota. I had joined the Army, and I wasn't going to be leaving for the Army for about another month in the middle of the summer. During that graduation week, one of my best friends in high school had also grown up with a father who took him into the outdoors a lot, and he had asked me if I wanted to accompany him and his little brother, who had just turned 14. And his father, three uncles, and three cousins on a 10-day fishing trip up in northern Manitoba. I wasn't sure how my parents would feel about it since in a month I was going to be leaving for the Army. But I went home and asked them, and they thought, this is a great way for you to try to fit in a whole summer before you leave would be to go on a trip like this. So I was excited about it. Like I say, I grew up in an outdoors family. We guided hunters in Montana and Wyoming on land that my family had and in northern Minnesota. So I wasn't a stranger to being out in remote areas of the wilderness. When I was 14, 15 years old, I was already elk hunting and spending time with other professional guides who were friends of my father. So I had learned from a lot of different sources about the outdoors and was comfortable in the outdoors. So I was really looking forward to this. My friend's dad had hunted with these three Inuit brothers who were native to this area and lived on this remote lake their whole lives. And they didn't typically guide fishermen. But they said if we came up with a, you know, bringing our own boats and stuff, that they would be happy to host us. It was a remote camp. We had to bring tents and things like that. They had uh, the camp itself had a like a covered pavilion that you could, um, it was pretty primitive, but yeah, that's where you'd eat lunch and have campfires. And they had a couple docks in. But they were the only ones on this large lake. It was part of the Churchill Reservoir. It's called Granville Lake. There were no cabins on this lake. It was all heavily forested. We had drove almost 30 hours from Sioux Falls, South Dakota, up to Flin Flon, which is a old historic logging community that's just on the east side of the Saskatchewan-Manitoba border. And once we got to Flin Fun, we had to go another 120 to 150 miles north of there yet on remote logging roads just to access this lake. When we had gotten there, I was really excited. I mean, you could tell the remoteness of it the last 
50 miles or so, we hadn't seen any mailboxes or any other vehicles. It was just so off the grid. And when we pulled into this camp, we met these three brothers. They were in their 50s and 60s. And uh, you could tell that they looked like they'd spent their whole lives there. I mean, they spoke uh, almost like their own outdoor language amongst each other, and they made us feel pretty comfortable. We're going to be there fishing for about eight days. And on the first day when we arrived, we set up camp. And this was the first week in June of 1987. So, you know, the ice had only been off that lake for a little less than a month, really. It was chilly in the mornings. By the afternoon, it had usually warmed up to almost 70 degrees, but it would be normally in the 40s in the morning, 40s and 50s. And we were excited, me and my friend and his little brother, because we were the youngest of this group. Even my friend's cousins were in their mid to upper 20s. And so maybe to some extent, we felt like we had a little bit to prove when it came to our outdoorsmanship. And the exciting thing was, is that we had 16 foot long boats, aluminum boats with 25, 30 horse motors on them. And, uh, my friend and I and his little brother, we were going to be in one of the boats just on our own. This was before smartphones and GPS. We had a laminated map in the boat that showed the underwater depths, kind of rudimentary. It's not, it wasn't like a modern uh, topographical map. It just something that these brothers had put together. It mapped out all the islands on the lake. This is a large lake, and it had over a dozen islands on it. And it would be easy to get lost since all the shoreline looked the same. It was all tall pines and poplars and birch trees. There there were no, it's not like there's a red cabin over there or a water tower over there. There was nothing to identify where you were visually. And if you got on the backside of one of these islands, it would be easy to get disoriented and lose sight of where camp was if you weren't really paying attention to your navigation. And so we started out just going a little ways away from the base camp the first day. And we had done pretty well that morning fishing. I mean, you could fish anywhere on this lake and catch fish. It, it, it was remote and it was well populated with walleyes, um, northern pike, lake trout. And we had caught several northerns and a few walleyes and we had them on a stringer. and the MO each day would be that we'd go out at seven or eight in the morning and fish until about one o'clock and then come back and everybody would have lunch together. And then later on in the day around three o'clock, we'd go back out again and fish till sundown. And there was four different boats in our party. Like I say, me and my friend and his little brother were in our own boat. And we came back that day at one o'clock or so to the dock, and we were really, you could tell we were proud. I mean, we had caught fish, and we thought, man, everybody's really going to be surprised when they see how well we did. And we pulled up to the dock, and everybody was already there. And we spent 10 minutes really bragging about how well we did. And then we realized that everybody had done really well. Everybody was holding stringers of fish. Our pride wasn't very long lived. If you'd like to be able to listen to the show without ads and have full access to bonus content, that's an option. To find out how, please go to mybigfootsighting.com. That afternoon, one of the things we thought was really interesting is we seen a moose swimming in the lake from the main shore to one of these islands. And later on in the day, we saw a white-tailed deer swimming from one island back to the main shore. And we, I'd never seen this before. As much as I'd been around big game animals, I'd never seen them swimming in the middle of a lake. And me and my 
friend and his little brother joked a lot about what would make a moose stand on a shoreline and look at another shoreline two miles away and say, I should swim there, you know? It just seemed odd. We're talking about big animals with hooves, not feet. They really don't seem to be built for swimming, but it was interesting. We've seen this each day. So on the second day, we went out a little bit further away. We actually went around one of the islands to fish and did well again. And the third day, we went out even further. But it was the fourth day that we had woken up, and there was an inch of snow on the ground. It was wet, sloppy snow. And, it, and you could tell it was cold. And we were up at 7 o'clock getting stuff ready to go fishing and noticed that everybody else in our party was still in the tent sleeping because evidently they were going to wait for it to get a little nicer out. The temperature raises so quickly in these morning hours that within an hour, all the snow was melted. And we had it out. It was still dreary and kind of drizzling out off and on. And as we were out fishing that morning, we were quite a ways away from the camp. This is the furthest we'd been. And we were in the middle of three different islands out on the lake. And my friend's little brother had said he had to go to the bathroom. And he was one of these fellows that can't pee out of a boat very easily. So we had done this before. We went and pulled up on the shoreline of one of these small islands. This is about a 20-acre island that is just covered in tall pines, 60 to 80-foot pines and a lot of birch trees. And the forest floor is just covered in dead fallen cedar scrubs. But the beach of the island surrounded pretty much the whole island. It was about a 20 to 25-foot wide gravel beach from the water's edge to the tree line. And the island, topographically, it sat about 30 to 40 feet above the water in the middle of it. It was like a little hill. And as my friend and his brother were relieving themselves there on the beach, we had pulled the boat up just a little bit onto the shore, and I was walking along the tree line, and it's so about 50 yards down from him when I noticed a game trail that was about three foot to four foot wide and just went straight up into the timber line. It was quite an incline, probably 30% grade. And you couldn't see very far up it. You could see 20, 30 foot, and then you'd have to walk up at 20 or 30 foot to see another 20 foot. It just the way the canopy hung over it. And the ground was like um, pine needles that were just on top of like almost like axle grease because of the rain we'd been getting. It was very slippery. And I just started walking up the trail. Um, I'd gotten about 30 feet up and I looked back and you really couldn't see the beach area very well. I mean, you lost sight of it pretty quickly and I, You'd take two steps up it and slide back a step, and I just kept working away at it. I was wearing sweatpants and a hoodie with, um, I think, like Converse high top tennis shoes, you know, typical high school kid clothes in 1987. And once I had gotten about 40 or 50 yards up this trail, it was probably about 40 yards up the trail. I heard an incredibly loud crack, like somebody had just stomped a wet log in half. It sounded like a firecracker going off. And this was to my left. I could tell exactly the location or you know, rough area that it came from. It wasn't real far away. It's probably 50 feet, 50 to 60 feet away. And... I stood there looking at all this deadfall and trying to look through these trees, thinking that I was going to see a black bear. I had been archery hunting before for black bears. I was aware of the sounds they'd make. And oftentimes when you have poplars and birch, especially on an island or something like this, they're not very deeply rooted. 
a lot of times black bears will rub their backs on a tree and just bust it over if it's just a birch tree or something. And I didn't want to just retreat down the trail not knowing what it was that made that sound because it was the first week of June. It could be a black bear sow with cubs. And I thought, you know, I don't want to, you know, trigger kind of a pursuit type situation. I thought if I just stood there still, I could at least identify how far they were away from me. It was very still. There was no breeze. The air was really saturated and wet. I mean, I could hear, I would be able to hear you snap your fingers if you were almost 150 feet away from me, you know. So I just stood there looking into these trees, waiting, knowing I was almost positive that I would see a black bear moving in those trees. And after about a minute, I hadn't seen anything move at all. And I looked down the trail and I could hear my friend and his brother yelling up to me, what was that? What was that? Jeff, are you, uh, uh, did you hear what that was? And because th they had easily heard it. The water was as smooth as glass. That day. I mean, there just wasn't any breeze, so they could easily hear it down there. And I still wasn't seeing anything moving. So I stood there for about another minute waiting, thinking I'm going to see something move here. And if I didn't, I thought I'd give it a minute. And if I didn't, I'd work my way back down the trail. And about another minute went by and I hadn't heard anything else yet. And I heard them talking down there on the beach. And I, I thought it sounded like they were coming up the trail behind me. So I was standing there looking down the trail trying to see as far as I can down it to see if I'd see them. And they weren't coming up. And when I turned back around to look up the trail, standing 15 feet right in front of me, I'm looking at two thighs that are the circumference of like two five-gallon buckets right next to each other. Now, this thing was standing about two feet higher in elevation than me just because of the grade of this trail I was looking uphill but I looked at these thighs and they were covered in dark like dark chocolate colored hair like almost completely black but it had a brown hue to it and as I looked up its body at the waist it was holding a birch log about six inches in diameter and it was about five foot long and on to my left, on that side of it, where the sound had came from, it had a root ball on this section of log that was a little bit bigger than an ice cream bucket, but not as not, not much bigger than that. It was a little bit bigger than than like a one gallon bucket. And I could see its fingers wrapped around. It was cradling this log at the waist. Its hands were about three foot apart. I could see its fingers easily. And as I looked up its body, its stomach and ch chest and shoulders, there was no hourglass shape to this thing. I mean, it was just massive. It was, at this point, trying to look up at its shoulders is like, the height of it, it, it was like standing underneath of a basketball hoop and trying directly under it and looking up at the rim. I mean, I was leaned way back looking up at its shoulders. And I estimated this to be about nine and a half to 10 foot tall. Um, the weight, it was probably close to 1,100 pounds probably just over between 11 and 1200 pounds i and i say that because growing up i had been with my father before grizzly bear hunting brown bear hunting in alaska and i had seen a bear that a professional guy named billy moles had shot before it was mounted and it was 10 foot tall and weighed around 1180 pounds it was a record size bear but I remember the mass of the legs and the width of the chest and the shoulders. 
and it didn't have wide shoulders as a bear, but just the that this its barrel shape, the mass of it. I had some reference of something that would be that height and that type of body mass and what it would weigh. And that's why in retrospect, I think this thing probably weighed just over 1100 pounds maybe. But as I'm looking at it, I'm, my mind is going through like this. It's just glitching. I'm thinking brown bear, black bear. I'm going through every big game animal I can think of. This is none of them. And it was really surreal to think that I, for a moment, after just a second of trying to analyze what I'm seeing here, I kept glitching back to human. Like somehow this thing is human. It, it is, despite its size and mass, it didn't look like any animal that I'd seen before. And that moment that I looked at its face and I, I can see, Still remember all of the detail. The skin was like like dried black dirt. It was very flat black looking with and kind of cracked. The skin was visible around its eyes and brow, and it was around its cheeks and, and a, a little bit around its mouth. But it had fairly longer hair. I mean, if I was if I was to explain the hair look to it. I mean, it was just like Keith Urban kind of. I mean, the 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 hair just drooped down that long around, kind of framed the face. And and uh, as soon as I looked at it in its eyes, it was like a a bomb went off. I mean, the this bird log that it was cradling in its hands at its waist, it just shucked it forward. It didn't. It looked like it, it. It was like it took no effort. It just, just like if I was to bounce past a basketball to you, that's what it. It just pushed this thing forward, and it hit me. It, it pushed it like downward at me because it hit me right in the stomach and the hips, and it took me off of my feet. I mean, it. It was like getting hit by a car. It. it I was launched backwards, and because I'm flying backwards and downhill at such a grade, it felt like I was in the air for quite a distance, like maybe 15, 20 feet before I hit the ground. And as soon as I hit the ground, I'm sliding backwards down this ground, like a felt like a water slide. But as I could still see it, I watched it jump about not very far, maybe six to 12 inches off the ground with both feet. And it just stomped its feet back onto the ground as it landed. And I could feel that reverberation in my back. Like if I walked up behind you and patted you on the back, I could feel that as it landed. And it did it as if it was upset. But I remember when I saw its face, it didn't look upset. It didn't look like a, an animal that's angry. It just it had a human element look to its face, and it just looked serious. Its mouth was open a bit, and its bottom lip kind of hung down and open a little bit. It kind of reminded me of when a bear is trying to scent you how they kind of curl their bottom lip out a little bit as if to waft the breeze up to their nostrils. It, it was holding its mouth like that, but it didn't, it never made a vocalization. It never like, it didn't try to reach towards me or anything. It just shucked this log out of its hands. And uh, when I hit the ground, I was sliding backwards down this trail. And I slid backwards. Immediately, I'm trying to roll over onto my stomach because I'm on my back sliding head first downward. And I'm trying to get to my stomach and get my feet underneath me because I felt like I had, like, the it was fight or flight. And I'm choosing flight because I don't know what this thing is. It's huge. I'm in shock at this point. I felt like I had the wind knocked out of me. and. I was struggling as I'm sliding backwards to get my right leg 
over this log because the log had turned about 90 degrees so that it was lengthwise with my body now as I'm sliding back. And I got my right leg over it, got my right shoulder turned to the side, and I slid all the way down this hill to the to where I hit gravel and I was now at the edge of the beach. And I jumped up to my feet and immediately I realized that I had sprained my right ankle fairly badly. I mean, I couldn't put weight on it. And my friends were standing on the beach and he's yelling at me, what's going on? What's going on? And he's looking at, they're looking at me all pie eyed, just like in panic mode. And I'm yelling and for the sake of your listeners, I'm not I'm not gonna say exactly what I yelled, but I was swearing. I was like, get get in the boat. And I'm screaming it at them, get in the boat, get in the, I and they they his younger brother, who like I say had just turned 14, was running, sprinting towards the boat, jumps inside into the boat and moves back to where the motor is. And Paul runs towards the boat, my my friend, and gets the to the boat and starts pushing it back into the water. And um, he's standing about thigh deep in the water at this point. And I couldn't stop looking at the tree line. I stood up and was limping as I walked, si- kind of sidestepping towards the boat. But I couldn't stop looking at the tree line. I felt like this thing was right behind me. Like this thing is going to walk out on this beach while we're on it. And I was panicking. I could hear Paul's little brother pulling on the motor, trying to get it started, and it wasn't starting. I waded into the water quite deep, or it was was top of my thighs, and got to the starboard side of the boat and grabbed the gunwale of the boat and just lifted myself up and flopped myself into it. And I sat on the middle bench and I'm still yelling at Paul, get in the boat, get in the boat. And Paul's down there holding the boat, waiting for Jamie to get this motor started. Now, the first three days we fished, Paul was always operating the motor. Me and Paul had spent a lot of time running boats. I don't know if Jamie's ever started a motor in his life, his little brother. Um, so he was back there f- frantically trying to start it. You could tell he was panicking. And at that time, I just told Paul, get in the boat. Just push us out as far as you can, get in the boat. And Paul kept yelling at me, what was it? What was it? Was it a bear? Was it a bear? And I wanted to tell him all the details, but I just couldn't. I was just so fixated on this tree line. And in my mind, I still wasn't sure what it was that I was looking at. I mean, unless somehow a human got out of its niche and grew 10 foot tall and got to that size, I couldn't explain to him what I was looking at and what what threw this at me. And so he jumps into the boat. He he pushes he grabs just the very front tip of the nose of the boat and lifts his body weight up and hops it and gets in. And he um passes me on the center seat as he goes to the back of the boat and tells his little brother to get in the front. And at that point, when his little brother passed me on the middle seat, I could see that he was he was coming undone. I mean, he was he wasn't crying, he was wailing crying and i i truly think he thought that i had been attacked by a bear and he sat down in the front of the boat facing back towards me and he just kept saying what's going on what's going on what's going on and i i said to him i says i i said you've got you got to stop screaming you know stop crying like that because one it was driving me insane as i'm trying to figure out myself what's going on and two i was really worried that it was just going to attract this thing out onto the beach and we weren't safe yet i mean the boat was only probably 20 feet from the shoreline in like two or three feet of water 
And at that time, I looked down the beach to the left. Paul's still trying to start the motor. I looked down the beach far to the left, about 75 yards down the beach. I see a black bear coming up the beach towards us. And I wouldn't say it was running and it wasn't walking. It was just kind of like, like almost like a gallop, so to speak. So, and it was looking straight to its left at this tree line. Every step it took, it was fixated on that tree line. And immediately I thought, whatever this thing was, I stand in front of must have spooked that bear too, because it's coming towards us. And it had covered about half of that distance towards us, about 30 yards, 40 yards, without even looking up. It just kept staring at this tree line. And then it looked forward and seen us in this boat. And it actually started running towards us. Like, I don't even know how to explain other than that. Maybe it was almost like it felt like, hey, something I'm familiar with or something. I don't know. But it started closing the distance us pretty quickly. And my friend's old brother seen this and he he was he was freaking out now. He's like, so there's a bear, there's a bear. This is a black bear that wasn't full grown. It was probably a two year old. It only weighed probably just over three hundred pounds. It wasn't you know, gigantic. And uh, I knew this wasn't what I was looking at. I knew that what I looked at wasn't a bear. And But as this thing got closer, Paul's little brother started losing it even more. And I grabbed him by the leg and I said, grab the stringer. Because we had caught a couple of northern pike that morning that were three, four pound fish. And they were on a stringer. And they were hanging right over the boat by the front of the boat where, where his little brother was. And he grabs the stringer and pulls it in. And I was just giving him these commands. I said, take one of those fish off the stringer and throw it up on the beach. And he took one of the northern pike off and he threw it onto the beach. And this bear went right up to where that fish was, stood on its hind legs and looked at us. And that's when I realized this bear is missing its right paw. And as a, as an archery hunter who'd spent some time hunting bears before, I I hadn't seen this myself, but I'd heard of how you know bears will get caught in a trap and lose a paw sometimes, or they'll, uh, especially with brown bears, the when they're born as cubs and the sow is taking care of two or three cubs, a lot of times the boars will attack these cubs and try to kill them and. Maybe he lost a paw that way. I didn't. I wasn't really sure. I didn't think about it much at the time. This is all in retrospect. I'm trying to figure out why would this bear have one paw missing. But it got down all fours and stood up, and it's holding this fish in its in its left left paw's claws and pinning it against the stub of his right arm, and it bites the head off of this fish. And it's just staring at us as he's chewing it and chewed it two or three times and swallowed it. And um, I'm yelling at Paul, you got to get this motor started. You got to get the motor started. And he, the, as he's trying to start it, I, I look back at the tree line still trying to figure out if, if this is, is this thing left or is it still here? And that bear snapped its head around and looked at the tree line and dropped that fish and took off running from the direction it came from. I didn't know a bear could run that fast. This thing was probably running 30 mile an hour down the beach. And Paul gets the motor started. I can hear it come to life. And I don't know in retrospect if Jamie had flooded that motor or if maybe he wasn't using the choke and he should have, I don't know. But Paul had gotten it started and threw it into reverse, and we started backing away from the shoreline. And this whole time, his little brother is still, like I say, not crying. I mean, he's wailing as he's kind of losing control. And, again, this is something that I've noticed in retrospect. I've got two sons who are 17 and 18 years old. And they're 
they've taken to be quite good outdoorsmen, but I remember where they were at maturity wise between 13, 14 years old and where they are now. That's, that's two different people. They would have reacted quite differently at 13 or 14 as they would now at 17 or 18. So I understand why it was probably more difficult for, for my friend's little brother to try to, you know, make sense of what's going on, even though none of us really could. But as we're backing this boat away from the shoreline, we backed up until we were somewhere between 75 and 100 yards from the shoreline. And as I'm watching that tree line, I watched this thing walk right out onto the beach. And it walked about three or four steps up to where that fish is laying there, standing right where we pulled away from the beach. And it stood there staring at us. And at that point, getting a second look at it, you could really tell how tall this thing was. And it looked like, I mean, if I ran down that beach and jumped as high as I could, I wouldn't have been able to touch the top of its head. This thing had to have been close to 10 foot tall. And the you could see the hair hanging down from its arms. It had, it re, it, it, shifted its shoulders at about a 45 degree angle and just lowered itself in this fluid movement straight down. And with its downward hand grabbed that fish and stood back up straight and held that fish out in front of its body, about just directly in front of it. And it never stopped staring at us the whole time it did this. And it stood there for 15 or 20 seconds longer, just standing there looking at us. And it turned around and started walking away. And as it did, I could see it holding this fish out to its side. And that's when you could see the hair hanging down off the arms. I mean, it was, it just draped down off of it, like eight, 10 inches long. You could see the hair on its back was, it looked like it flowed in some areas and like it was like shiny and matted in others. And I, the only thing I can attribute that to is maybe it was wet just because we had been getting some rain that morning after the snow melted. But it in three or four steps, it was back in the tree line and gone. And during the time it was on the beach, Paul is yelling at me, what is that? And there's several expletives he threw in with that, but he just kept yelling over and over, Jeff, what is that? Jeff, what is that? And Paul's a pretty calm individual. I mean, he was never the one to really get excited about anything. He was soft-spoken, very well-spoken, but he was an analytical type of person. Uh, He was the one that would be in the room and not say much, just soak up what everybody else was saying. And when he spoke, it was usually something pretty intelligent. So to see him in this mode of anxiety, yelling, what is that? What is that? That kind of amped me up a little bit more too because I wasn't used to that demeanor from him and his brother when Paul started asking what is that his brother turned around and looked at the beach and saw it too and he just came undone like he was cowering down in the boat seat like halfway to the floor and crying and wailing and I didn't do anything other than just stare at it. I was I was so in shock that I was getting an opportunity to really see how big this thing like like I wasn't losing my mind. I knew what I what I felt I was standing in front of, but that second opportunity to, to see it again and analyze its size and just confirm in my mind that this is not a brown bear, this is not a black bear, this is not any this is not a human. I mean, it simply couldn't be human being that size. And once it got into that tree line and was gone, we probably sat there for probably took a minute for Paul to get out of this whole anxiety mode and he threw the boat in gear and we started heading back towards the camp. We were probably about a 45 minute ride away from that camp. I mean, we were miles up the lake. And we had gone about maybe 10 minutes wide open, which in a boat 
with three guys and 25 horse motor, I mean, we're probably only going about 22 mile, 24, 25 mile an hour. He had throttled the boat down, put it in neutral, and shut the motor off. And we're just sitting in the middle of the lake. And it's calm as class. And he's looking at me going, what is going on here? What just happened? And his little brother still had it a little bit under control more than he did, but was still, like, hyperventilating and, you know, making audible noises, just trying to breathe. And um, I put my hand on his little brother's leg, and I said, we're going to be okay. You know, I'm just trying to say whatever I could come to my mind to try to calm him down. And that's when I took the, a few minutes to tell them everything that happened on the trail. I said, I walked up that trail. I heard that something crack really loud. I said, you guys must have heard it because you were. I heard you yelling to me. Was that you? What's going on? And I told them how I thought it was a black bear, and I didn't want to run down the, you know, try to move motor down that trail until I knew where it was. Was it 10 feet away from me? Was a hundred yards away. From me. I really wanted to know this before I started trying to take off because I knew what could happen if you triggered kind of a pursuit mode in a sow that had cubs or presented yourself as some type of a danger. And I thought just standing still, maybe it would just leave, you know, give it an opportunity to leave with its cubs. I was telling these guys all of this. But I told him, I says, as I turned around and stood in front of this thing, it was 15 feet away from me. And I said, Paul, its thighs were the size of your chest. I mean, it's like two five-gallon buckets right next to each other. The mass on this thing was huge. And I said, I, it was hard for me to tell exactly how tall it was because I was standing on a really steep incline on that trail. But when it walked on the beach, I said, how tall do you think that was? It had to have been 10 foot tall. And he agreed. He said it had to be over a thousand pounds and it had to have been 10 foot tall. And we sat there for a little bit talking about this. And I think his little brother was the first one that brought up the word Bigfoot. He said, do you think it was a Bigfoot? And me and Paul were just staring at each other, trying to think of what else would even explain what it was like i say neither none of us had had we were from south dakota our even though we had been big game hunting a lot in montana wyoming northern minnesota ohio upper peninsula michigan we'd never seen anything like this before and never heard anybody tell me stories of anything like that and i told paul i said we got to get back to the camp so we can tell your dad and Paul sat there quietly for, felt like a long time, probably like 30 seconds. And he looked at me and said, I don't think we should tell anybody. And I said, why wouldn't we tell your dad, Paul? We have to tell somebody about this. And he said, Jeff, he says, we're, the, we're just kids. These guys are going to make fun of us. We're supposed to be here four more days fishing. They're going to do nothing but make fun of us. Nobody's going to believe us. We're going to be the butt of their jokes. And he says, nobody's going to believe us. And I didn't feel comfortable with Paul's decision, but yet this wasn't my dad. I mean, I would have told my dad. And I don't know if he would have, you know, had he not had an experience like that and seen one, I don't know how if he would have believed me or not. But I think I would have told my dad, but since this wasn't my dad, I, I tried to respect Paul's decision. I said, if you don't want to tell him, then I'm, I guess that's what we will do. We won't tell anybody. And we started heading back. And his little brother had finally gotten his emotions under control to where he wasn't visibly shaken he just looked more like he's just staring at the floor of the boat in shock and I, i'm sure that he was in shock when i joined the army i spent six years in the army in the 29th infantry regiment and then in the 82nd airborne and i know what ptsd looks like i know what it's like to be in shock or to have something 
you know, really affect you in a way where you feel emotionally paralyzed. I've seen it in other people. And so I just kept trying to talk to Jamie, telling him, don't worry. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. And as we got back to the, the dock, we were a little bit late. And I don't know if people were worried about us, but like I said, we didn't have cell phones and stuff. When we get back to the dock, everybody's standing out there. And for, you know, the first three days when we'd come back to the dock, like I say, we looked like some war party that was coming back hooping and hollering. and But not this time. When we pulled up to the dock, we were pretty somber. And um, I think they realized that as we got tied the boat to the dock and got out of it, they were like, are you guys okay? What's wrong? You know? And we were just like, yeah, everything's fine. And Paul and his little brother and his dad and his uncles and cousins and two of those brothers walked off of the dock. And this is a long dock. It's like 60 foot long. It goes way out into the water. We had all four boats tied to it. But they walked up to this area where they had a campfire going and they were going to make lunch. And I was just standing there looking out at the lake in the in the direction of where that island was. And the oldest of these three brothers, these Inuit brothers that were the guides, was standing about halfway up the dock, and I was standing out at the end of it. And he walks up to me and says, are you all right? And I said, yeah. And he says, did you get in an argument or a fight with your friends? I said, no. I said, we we just had something happen out there, and I'm still trying to make sense of it in my head. And he goes, well, tell me about what happened. And I said, we pulled up to a small island way out past Patton Island. And the interesting thing was on this map, some of the larger islands actually had names to them. And I remember that the island next to this one was quite a bit bigger than the island we were on, and it was called Patton Island. But the island we were on to the northwest of it didn't have a name. But I figured just for sake of him understanding where I'm talking about, I said we were on Patton Island. And Paul's little brother was taking a leak, and while we were there, something happened, and I'm still trying to make sense of it. It doesn't make sense to me. And he says, I want to show you something. And he walks down the dock, and I'm following him. And we get to the shoreline, and we walk. The, we, we took a right and walked away from where everybody else was. Quite a ways down this trail along the shoreline, they had this old run-down wooden boathouse that they stored, you know, life jackets and traps and, I mean, all kinds of hunting stuff. And next to it, Laying on the ground, upside down was about a 16-foot aluminum boat, similar to the one we were using. And um, it had a tarp over it. And the tarp was anchored down in all four corners by big rocks. And he kicked a couple of the rocks away and pulled the tarp off this boat. And on that boat, the starboard side is completely caved in. It's laying upside down, but you can see it. Clearly, it looked like if you laid this boat on a highway and ran into it, just T-boned it with a motorcycle doing about 50 or 60 mile an hour, it was just, there's a giant V caved into the side of this boat. And I said, what happened there? And he said, well, last fall I was guiding a moose hunter and it was a party of three of them and each one of my brothers and I we're each guiding somebody, and we had seen a decent moose on the shoreline of one of these small islands, and so we pulled up on the island on the backside of it and took our time to work our way around downwind from it, coming up that side of the island, and as we came around the corner, the guy I was guiding got a shot on this moose and killed it, and, and it was a nice moose. It was laying right on the beach you know, 15 feet from the water's edge. And we walked up to it, and we took pictures of him next to it. And then 
we went back to the boat and I put him in the boat and brought him back to camp. And he said, then he came back to the island to dress this moose and cape it and quarter it out. And he was on his own, but he felt that it would be an easy job because he didn't, they didn't have to haul it anywhere like they normally do. It was right on the edge of the water. He'd throw the quarters into the boat and the back steps and bring it back. And he said, while I was there, it took him some time to get it caped out. And he had it quartered, had the quarters wrapped, and he grabbed one of the front quarters and it's pretty heavy. I mean, a, a, an adult bull moose is probably like 1,800 pounds. So, I mean, one of these quarters probably weighed 150 pounds maybe. I don't – maybe more. I don't know. But he had lifted it up and got it over one shoulder and was carrying it slowly to the boat. And he threw it into the front area of the boat. And when he did, he said something screamed at him from the tree line. And before he can even get turned around, this thing was running across the shoreline to him. And immediately, without without visually seeing it, he couldn't make sense. He said maybe either this was a bear or it was a cow moose, which oftentimes a cow moose will charge you. They stay with their young for three years. And they're very protective of them. I mean, you could have a bull moose that maybe even has a halfway decent set of antlers and there could still be a cow that its mother is still kind of protecting it or playing that protection role. But he jumped over the edge into the boat just as trying to get some sense of security or some barrier between him and whatever this was that's coming at him. And he says, when I looked at it, this thing was huge. He says, bigger than a man, probably weighed more than any bear he'd ever seen. And uh, it ran up to the edge of the boat, and he was contemplating jumping out the other side of the boat. And this thing came up and started throwing its knee into the side of the boat. Like it placed its hands on the starboard side of the boat midsection and just started thrashing its knee into the side just boom boom over and over about six or seven times and each time this side would cave in another four to six inches until finally it was just like caved into a v on the side of it and this thing walked up to the front of the boat he said it just took a step or two to the side grabbed this quarter by the leg with one hand and lifted it up threw it over its shoulder and walked back to the tree line and was gone. And he had a two-way radio that he wasn't sure if he was even within range of where his brothers were. But he started calling them on the phone, just screaming, you've got to get out here, you've got to get out here. And he was trying to explain to him where he was. And he said he... At that point, he grabbed his weapon, was laying in the boat. He, I think he said he had a 338 Lapua that was in the boat, but it wasn't, he, he wasn't carrying it with him. And I'm not even sure it was loaded at that point. But he loaded it and he sat there in the boat and was watching this tree line. And he, and he said it took about 35, 40 minutes for his brothers to get there. And the whole time, every couple of minutes, this thing would vocalize and scream at him from in those trees. And it was pacing back and forth within the tree line. He said, I couldn't see it. It, it was just far enough in. But it, it, I, it would vocalize from one area and then it'd vocalize again. And you could hear it moving back and forth. It was stomping and kicking stuff. He said, I, I was, he said, I've never seen anything like this. I, he said, I've never been so scared in my life. And then when he heard the boat motors, when they were, you know, a mile or two out, he could hear that his brothers coming across the lake. He finally felt like we're going to get out of here. And he said, I didn't hear it. It's like once it had heard these boat motors in the distance, it had stopped vocalizing or making any more noise. And when his brothers got to the shoreline, 
He said, immediately, I'm thinking they aren't going to believe me. They're never going to believe me. And so when they got to the shoreline, they could tell he was pretty visibly shaken. And they asked what happened. And he said he was caping this moose out and had one quarter of it in the boat. And a cow moose charged him and rammed the side of the boat. Because he did not want to spend the rest of his life with his brothers not believing him if he told him he saw a 10-foot tall Bigfoot that weighed a 1,000 pounds. And his brothers didn't have a problem with this. He said they, they seemed pretty comfortable with my explanation what happened until we started loading the quarters in the boat. He said, I didn't even factor this in. They said, you're missing one. And then they start saying, dude, what's going on? What happened? And he said, I just told him exactly what happened. And I said, did they believe you? And he said, my youngest brother believed me, but my middle, the middle brother didn't believe him. Like he really questioned whether or not he was losing it or not. And I'm just sitting there trying to process all this while I'm looking at this boat and I'm thinking, man, I, it almost felt like somebody had lifted a thousand pounds off my back that somebody else had, other than me and these two friends of mine, had actually experienced something like this. And I said to him, Did you ever tell anybody else? Or he says, No. He says, I don't think anything good would ever come of telling anybody about this. After this experience of sharing it with my brothers, he says, Unless somebody stood there and seen something like this, I don't know that they're really capable of believing you. It, it just doesn't make sense in their head that this can exist, that this is real. And then he asked, are you physically okay? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, something's wrong. And he, I didn't realize, but my T-shirt, I had a white T-shirt on that was hanging out underneath of my sweatshirt that had blood on it. And that's when I grabbed my sweatpants on my left hip and pulled them down to look at my hip. And about the size of my hand, there was a scrape on my left hip that was bleeding. And then I lifted my whole shirt up in front, and my whole stomach was black and blue. I mean, it looked like a heavyweight boxer. It just punched me in the stomach about four times. And this wasn't even, I mean, this was an hour, hour and a half, probably an hour and a half after it happened. And he says, I'm going to get you some stuff. He says, just go to your tent right now, and I'll meet you there. And I went to my tent, and he came in and brought some gauze and some, you know, bandages and stuff like that. And he said, just let me know if you need anything else. But he says, "I are you going to tell everybody? And I said, no, Paul doesn't want to tell everybody. He's adamant about not telling his dad what happened. And he says, that's probably for the best because he says, I can't imagine what it'd be like having a father not believe what you're saying. And that night, we sat around the fire and just tried to maintain this whole, it was still somber. It was still hard to enjoy the trip like we normally would have. And I think that guy recognized that in, in all three of our demeanor. And he had walked up to me as, aside from everybody else, and he said, my best advice for you is try to just enjoy the next four days. Try to, in your mind, get to a place before all this happened and just exist there. Try to have fun fishing and get this out of your head for now. And that night, all night long, me and my friend and his little brother were sharing a tent night all night long. I could hear his little brother just, he was just cr like quietly just crying in a sleeping bag. And I, I didn't, I didn't, I wanted to say something to him. I didn't know what, what would, what I could say to him. I honestly kind of felt like I just wanted to cry too, because I was so frustrated with the fact that something like this had happened and it still didn't make sense to me. But after that, we'd gotten home eventually and I joined the army, left for the army. 
And like I said, I spent six years in the Army. And during that time, I was an EOD tech with a security clearance. And I never really felt that I was in an atmosphere where I could talk to somebody about it or tell anybody about what had happened to me in Manitoba because I was so worried that they'd think I was losing my mind or I'd lose my security clearance. or So that was just something that I kind of blocked out. And I don't think that was hard for me and Paul to do because, you know, we were both out of high school now and we're starting new chapters in our life. But for his little brother to spend the next three or four years walking those hallways around people that he couldn't talk to this about, I really was concerned about how that maybe affected him. And um, when I got out of the military, I went to college for four years, never really met anybody in college that I could talk to or share something like that with. And eventually I started, I got a real estate license and started a real estate firm. And I was still guiding hunters during the hunting season on our family's land. And I had a professional relationship with a lot of other guides across the country that we would send referrals to each other. We'd trade trips with each other and I'd hunt with them. And I'd nonchalantly kind of ask, you know, have you ever seen anything that you couldn't explain or things like that? And every now and then I'd, I'd meet a guide that was like that. I, that would tell me, yeah, I, this one time I was screamed at or we had stuff thrown at us, but nobody had ever told me they stood in front of a 10 foot tall, 11, 1200 pound Bigfoot. But I'd heard plenty of stories that were stuff that you couldn't explain as being bears or elk or anything like that. But as I started my real estate business, I had a lot of friends that in professional relationships I developed. These were pretty wealthy people that were doing real estate investing and they were using me in a partnership. And I really worried if I talked about this publicly with any of them or if any of them ever heard me talk publicly about it, that, you know, if they didn't believe me or they it established some kind of a trust issue that financially it would really have an impact on me. And so for a long time, I just didn't talk about it much. But I always had these questions trying to understand what I saw. I had accepted that I'd seen a Bigfoot. but you know, I had these questions about, you know, how many of them are there? How common would this be? Are there people that have seen this and don't talk about it? And um, when I turned about 49 years old, I got to a point where financially I felt like I had achieved as much as I needed to do. It was pretty content. And I didn't care at that point anymore. I mean, if, if anybody who did business with me. If they didn't want to do business with me anymore, I'm still going to wake up tomorrow and do my thing. And so I started talking publicly about it. I still have a home in South Dakota, but I have a place in Bemidji, Minnesota on a big lake up there. And um, I had met Doug Hycheck and was telling him about what had happened to me. And he said, I've heard thousands of encounter stories, literally. But he says, you're one of only three or four that I have heard that actually was attacked or had something injure them in some way. He says, this is just really an incredible story. But I started talking to Doug about how I was hearing stories from people in the Bemidji area that had seen this. And I wanted to get into researching and getting out and looking at this more. And so for months, me and Doug developed a research strategy that was maybe designed more to collect DNA rather than try to get a picture or a video. And for the last four or five years, I've spent in that area researching this. And I've had further experiences since then. But for the most part, I've, I've never had anything like what happened to me in Manitoba happen again. I've never been that close to one again. I've never seen one that clearly again. But 
had I not stood in front of one and seen it as clearly as I did and then watched it walk on the beach afterwards, I think I'd be the world's biggest skeptic at this point, too. Even during my research, when I hear things, when I hear these knocks and when I hear vocalizations and stuff, I a lot of it I can't attribute to another big game animal or a canine. We have wolves and coyotes in our area. I, a lot of these sounds are ones that I'm familiar with, all of those sounds and that I can't attribute to those animals. But yet had I not seen it or stood in front of one like that, I don't know that I would not be a skeptic also. So I'm always understanding as to why people are reluctant to accept it. And the words that that oldest brother, that, that Inuit guide told me, he said, you know, unless somebody stood in front of one, he said, are they really capable of processing it and understanding that these things are real? But I always try to keep that in mind when I hear somebody share an account and I think, well, that seems far-fetched. I mean, even other areas of the paranormal, when people talk about things like dogmen or ghosts or UFOs, I think, you know, just because it hasn't happened to me doesn't mean that it couldn't happen, you know, or that it couldn't be real. So I try to keep that in mind, but that's my first encounter that I had in Manitoba. Well, that's it for tonight's show. If you've had a Bigfoot sighting and would like to be a guest, please go to mybigfootsighting.com and let us know. Thanks for listening. Have a great night. Seen a bunch of run down new horse towns where the church is the backbone, loves in the bow. And the five string melodies groove in. With the farmland rows where the roots run deep, beyond the noise of the busy streets. Where the songs of the south are soothing. When I hear the front porch picking down home rhythm ringing out. I don't run from banjo music Yeah The sound of a memory brings me back To the bluegrass playing on my dad's a track His pick-up man had been through it Getting through the day on scrugs and skags Booking a bales to those Tennessee jams There's no other way that I'd do it Hear the front porch picking down home rhythm ringing out I don't run from banjo music Yeah Summit on the backwards, backwards and double time Looking at the soul and the drummer on Kentucky style Those are the anthems drumming now Country boy living When I hear the front porch picking down home rhythm ringing out Rushing by with the bass on the stereos booming. When I hear the front porch picking down, home rhythm ringing out. I don't run from banjo music. Yeah. Something going backwards, backwards and double time. Looking at the soul and the tremor on Kentucky style. Those are the anthems drumming now. Country boy living. Best sweet tea, kind of sound.